Turn with me this morning in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark 7, 6 through 9. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Verse 9. All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. I have come here this morning. I enjoyed Brother O'Neill's discussion of prayer and what he was praying for. He prayed that uh, we would be brought to repentance. He prayed that we would repent of our sins. He, he prayed that we would know that God loves us and uh, is there for us. And I, I come here, as I was listening to him this morning, I realized that I've been sent, at least in part, to answer those prayers. But the way that I'm going to have to do it is to speak to you in a way that you have probably never been spoken to before. I'm going to have to tell you things that most people won't tell you. I'm going to have to hurt you to heal you. I will probably make some of you mad. I will probably offend some of you. But I want you to know... The backdrop of everything I say is the truth that Christ indeed does love you, that He does love you individually, and He does love you as a group. And so whatever I say, you need to keep that as the backdrop, that sometimes out of love for us, God has to come to us and say things that are very hard for us to hear. All right? Now here we are in this COVID-19 situation, and I think everybody's world has been rocked a little bit, hasn't it? Everybody's world has been rocked. I mean, we have been thrown completely out of what is normal. And it has been the weirdest three or four months of my life, I can tell you that. And I'm sure for yours. Most of us have never seen anything like this. But there's just an, it's, like the, it's like the ground under your feet is moving. And what you need to see is if you feel uncomfortable, if you feel burdened, worried, uh, disconcerted, this is God shaking you up. God is shaking up the entire nation, but He is starting with His own people. So I'm going to have to tell you things this morning that you're not going to like to hear. But my hope is and my prayer is because God is humbling us and breaking us that maybe we'll be willing to listen in a way that we weren't willing to listen three months ago when everything was just fine and everything was going along as normal. And know that I love you, that the things that I say this morning are because I love you, because I desire for you better things than you are experiencing now as a congregation. There are better things out there. There is more than what you are experiencing as a congregation. There is more. But you're going to have to hurt before you can get to that point. So I come and I want you to remember that I said that as I go through this. Let me begin with a few questions this morning, and I sincerely want you to answer me because this is part of my discussion with you. Let me ask you a few questions about your church here. Before COVID-19, how many people did you average in attendance? 30 people. 30 people, okay. How many baptisms have you had in the last year? Zero. Uh, how many have you had in the last five years? Maybe zero. Zero. What evangelism do you do as a congregation? What outreach do you do? Okay, you adopt a church in Africa. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, how about individually? When's the last time any one of you shared the gospel with someone? You don't have to answer that one because I know that's going to embarrass people. I don't want you to raise your hand or anything. Okay. What do you do for the poor? We talked about the the church in Africa, which is wonderful. What else do you do for the poor? Do you have any ministries to drug addicts? Any ministries to alcoholics? Any ministries to prostitutes? Hmm? You feeding any poor folks? Given these facts, and I'm not here to condemn, I'm not, I'm not asking you these questions to embarrass you. All right? But look, you have to realize something. God's actions are instructive. And He has sent all the churches home for two straight months. Do you realize that? 
He sent us home for two straight months. We're in our third month, and we're still meeting partially. He is saying something about how He sees us in this action. He is saying something. At our church, I've been doing Facebook Live on Sunday nights, and I've been talking about what God is saying to the family, for example. Did you notice that God is sending mothers, fathers, and children all back home? Have you noticed that? Do you think He has something He's saying there? I want you to go back home and I want you to learn from the start, from the beginning, from the foundation, what I expect of a family, how I want it to be set up and run. So I'm sending everybody home. And he's sending everybody in the church's home. Everybody go home. And I'm going to tell you a little later why. One reason that he's sending us all home. What he's saying to us for doing that. But given these facts, the low attendance, beautiful building, but nobody to fill it. No baptisms in the last five years. No baptisms maybe, no baptisms last year, maybe in five years. Very little, if any, local evangelism. Individually, we're not sharing the gospel. We're doing no ministries to the poor. Given these facts that came out of your own mouth, I didn't bring these up, I don't know anything about you. I didn't come here with an agenda. I don't know anything about you. But given these facts, are you alive or are you dead? You tell me. In Revelation 3, 1, Jesus said, I know your works. And it was, I know what you do to serve me. I know what you're doing. And I know what you're not doing. And you have a name that you're alive. Finish it for me, somebody. But you're dead. So based on your own works, your own words, the things that you do in the service of Christ, are you alive or are you dead? You're dead. But based on your works, I would say that the words of Jesus in Revelation 3.1 actually don't even apply to you. Because he said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. But what I would suggest to you is that you, have a na- you don't even have a name that you're alive. That people drive up and down this road and they don't even notice the buildings here. If it burned down today, they'd be like, what building was that? And you're near one of the largest home developments in the state. Blowing up. I told you I have to hurt you. I have to hurt you. Everybody knows you're dead, but you. Jesus knows you're dead. The world knows you're dead. You're the only ones that haven't come to that realization yet. And there are thousands, thousands of Southern Baptist churches. You know, the State Convention of South Carolina has set up a whole group. There are people who are assigned to work to close churches. That's what they do. They try and close a church and then recapture the land or recapture the income or move somebody else in there. They have a whole group of people who are trying to take care of the deceased churches. It's everywhere. Now, it's not just you. It's everywhere. Here's the question. Why are you dead? That's the question. And COVID is sent to you so you'll listen to me. You'll listen to God. O'Neill, you said you wanted to hear from Him. You said you wanted Him to come. You wanted to bring you to repentance. Are you going to listen today? Why are you dead? Now here, here it comes. It's going to hurt now. It's going to hurt. It's taken 20 years for me to figure this out. You are idolaters. You're idolaters. Over the course of years, the God you serve has slowly shifted to a God that is no God at all. Yes, He goes by the same name. You even use the Bible when you speak of Him. But He is not the God of the Scriptures any longer. And for this multi-generational idolatry, been going on for years, Jesus is putting this church to death. He said, oh no, Jesus won't put a church to death. You, You have read Revelation lately? He said, if you don't repent, I'll come and kill your children with death. It's written. Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Jesus speaks of idolaters in our text. He says, in vain they worship me. In vain they worship me. Fruitlessly, unsuccessfully. The word vain means barren, empty, hollow, pointless. Have you ever felt like coming to church is pointless? 
Well, what are we doing here? We're not doing mercy work. We're not doing evangelism. We're not standing for the truth. We're not reaching out. What are we doing here? What he's saying is, they worship something that is not me. In vain, they worship me. They think they're worshiping me, but they're not worshiping me. In Isaiah, where this quote comes from, Jesus is quoting Isaiah here. Isaiah pronounces something upon those who do this. He pronounces something on those who think they are worshiping God, but are not, are doing it in vain, are worshiping something that's not God. He says, woe to them. In Isaiah, he says, woe to them. Woe. And you are experiencing that woe. Look at the empty pews. That's the woe. Look at the lost children. That's the woe. God has sent us out of the churches. That's the woe. Look at the culture. That's the woe. Homosexual marriage. Law of the land. That's the woe. Transgenderism. That's the woe. The Lord says, when my people disobey me, I will raise up oppressors to oppress them. You're feeling oppressed yet. You feel like you don't have a voice. That the world is collapsing upon your worldview. It's collapsing upon morality. Remember, Psalm 9 says that all nations that forget God will be turned into the grave. And my friends, 50 years ago, this church, churches like this, churches in general, were full. So what has changed? Satan's still doing the same thing he's doing. The world's still doing the same thing it's doing. What's happened is we have changed. The reason the culture's like it is is because the church is like it is. Whoa, you're experiencing the woe. W-O-E. So how did they get there? How did these folks here that Jesus is talking to, these religious people, they knew the, they knew the Scriptures, they knew the Bible, they knew it. How did they end up worshiping God in vain? Verse 7, And in vain they worship me, here it is, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Notice the word that's repeated, tradition. Traditions are the things that led them to worshiping a God that was not God. They thought that they were worshiping Him, but they were not because of their traditions. The word tradition in the Greek, it literally means to hand something to someone else. I, I take it and I hand it to you. And then you take it and you hand it to someone else. That's what a tradition is. It's being handed down. They had come to believe and act upon what they had learned from prior generations as if those things were God's own will. In the process, they created another truth and another God. This is what you have done, but you don't know it. This is what you have done. I'm not saying that you're not sincere. I'm not saying that you don't sincerely believe you're following Christ and sincerely believe you're doing this. I'm not saying that you don't sincerely believe that. But the fact of the matter is you are not. These people were sincere. Zealots fired up. But they were zealously wrong. You've been handed down this set of ideas about how the church is to be organized, how it is to make decisions, how it is to be furnished, the dress code, who is to do what and what amount. But nearly all of the things that you've been handed are lies. They're not actually in the Bible. And it does not match what God actually says and wants. Traditions. You are worshiping traditions. There's an excellent example of how this can happen in the Old Testament account of Jeroboam. The message is entitled this morning, The First Baptist Church of Jeroboam. Look at 1 Kings. Turn with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 12. Let's see that this has already happened in a massive way in the spiritual history of God's people. 1 Kings 12, I want to read verses 25 through 33. And then I'll comment on it and help you see how this is the same thing that we are doing. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. 
And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the king of David may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, Is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places, and made priests from every class of people, who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing the, to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests at the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. Okay, so let me help you understand what's going on here. All right, Solomon, you remember you have David. David becomes king, king of Israel. David has a son named Solomon. And Solomon becomes king. And what Solomon did was Solomon uh, went on a massive building spree. He built all kinds of stuff, spent all kinds of money. And the people were very tired of all the building, very tired of all the taxes, very tired of all the money being spent. Anybody feel that way today? How, how can you borrow your way out of a virus? That's, I'm still trying to figure that one out. But so, so when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took over. And the wise old elders went to Rehoboam and said, Hey, look, you've got to back off. This is too much for the people. They're going to rebel. And Rehoboam, uh, he, Rehoboam says, Nah, I ain't doing that. I'm going to double up on them. Pride. I'm going to double up on them. They're not going to tell me what to do. So that opens the door. And one of Solomon's advisors was a guy named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, he saw an opportunity to take power. So he, tried, he took power. And what he did was he took the northern ten tribes away and made a new kingdom. In the Old Testament after this, they'll refer to that northern kingdom as Israel, the northern ten tribes. And the rest they'll call Judah. Judah and Benjamin were the two that remained under Rehoboam. The other ten went with Jeroboam. But in order for Jeroboam to, to fully capture power, he knew he had to replicate the worship of Jehovah. He had to do something because the people were going to go to Jerusalem and, and worship God there, and Jerusalem is in Judah. So he didn't want them going there anymore. So what he did was he built altars in Dan and Bethel. So what he did was he built a temple in Dan, which is way up in the north. Make it real convenient for you. Let me get your vote. I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to build something nice for you. You go to Dan and just follow me. And then he builds one in the south in Bethel. So it's strategic what he did. And he said, look, you can go worship here. And he built two golden calves and he put one in the north and one in the south. So that the people didn't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. And let's look at what he did here. He made two golden calves. You remember those from the Exodus that uh, Aaron made. He set up altars in Dan and Bethel. He built shrines all over. So he built these many places to go uh, and worship God. He said, go wherever you want to. We're going to make this convenient. Sounds a lot like the seeker-sensitive movement, doesn't it? Let's just make everything convenient. Let's make it really easy for you to believe. Who cares what you do after that? Who cares if that's what God wants or not? Let's just make it all easy. He built them all over. He set up his own priest, his own feast, and he even made himself the high priest and offered sacrifices. Woo! That boy was on a mission to do some bad, evil stuff. Thomas Rogers had a comment about Jeroboam that brings up an, a, a term that we need to learn today. He says this, In this way, Jeroboam devised a syncretic religion, and that's the word we want to come back to. He took what little knowledge the people had of Jehovah, that's God, and what they believed about Baalism, that's all the foreign gods in the land, and he brought the two together. Syncretism. S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M. I told you there'd be a spelling test. Syncretism. It's when you take some, one thing and you blend it with another thing and you go and you end up with a third thing. That's what a syncretism is. So what he did was he took 
He took the real worship of God that God had prescribed in the law. He took some other things and he mixed it together to, and he created a new religion. And this new religion is known simply as Jeroboam's sin. He became a byword, Jeroboam's sin. And God did not like this at all. When God says, I want it done a certain way, He wants it done a certain way. And so over time, what God did was the northern ten tribes, they were lost in 722. The Assyrians came in and destroyed them. And it wasn't until 586 B.C. Jeroboam sin moved into the south. And it was 586 B.C. that the Babylonians came and destroyed the whole place. Jeroboam sin. But what's most interesting to note for us is what Jeroboam didn't do. The majority of his errors were not what we would call theological errors. He did not change the doctrine of sacrifice itself. He did not teach that animal sacrifices were no longer necessary. He did not teach that you didn't need priests and you didn't need an altar. His sin was not that he had set aside God's word altogether for an entirely new teaching. His was that he simply would not obey what God had already written. Where were the priests to come from, everybody? They had to come from Aaron, that lineage. Who decided who the high priest was? God did. Who decided where they were going to worship? God did. So he, he didn't really change everything. He just made it into something new. He wouldn't obey what God had said in these practical areas. Even though this is true, God still labeled what he did as idolatry and judged it as such. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn? We can learn that idolatry does not have to be based on doctrinal error to be considered idolatry. Idolatry, the kind that God hates and judges severely, can be built upon a foundation of rebellious, disobedient behavior to His will in non-theological areas. In other words, you don't have to go out and say Jesus is not the Son of God, He's not deity, in order to still be committing idolatry. It is this tendency with Baptists today to equate idolatry, heresy, and apostasy. In other words, to, a, to, a, to, to, to think of moving outside of the faith as only being what you think about these doctrinal things that has made our idolatry that much more difficult to recognize and root out. Baptist view doctrine. How many times have you heard a preacher stand up here and talk about doctrine? True doctrine. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of Jesus. You heard that? Nobody's ever heard that word? I'm sure you have if you're a Baptist. The word doctrine. It's the teachings. Baptists view it as the most important thing in defining who we are and how we stand before God. We think we've got the doctrinal high ground. And the Presbyterians and the, and the Pentecostals and the Lutherans, they're all lower than us because we've got the doctrine figured out. We've got the true salvation figured out, the true church model figured out. We've got it all. We've got the doctrine. For all practical purpose, Baptists define doctrine as head knowledge of the principles of the Bible, things like God's nature, the deity of Christ, the elements of the gospel, what makes up the gospel, the inerrancy of Scripture. That's the way Baptists historically look at doctrine. But when we define it this way, we're only half right. And that is what's leading us to be doing all the things that we don't realize we're doing that are idolatrous. The Bible adds something to what doctrine is. True doctrine is not just what you believe about theology. It's also how faithfully you obey God in the commandments that He sets out for you. Doctrine is not just theology, it is theology and obedience. And Paul called it a doctrine which accords with godliness. Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, the same people he's talking to in Mark 7. And he says, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. I want you to notice what Jesus is upset about with the Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. In other words, they're teaching you the truth. But do not do according to their works. 
They're not living the way God said to live. They're not carrying on the way God said to live, to, to carry on. Saying you believe the right things about God, but refusing to obey Him in practical and moral matters is to reject Him as your God altogether. Psalm 81.11, the Lord said, But my people would not heed my voice. All right, listen to that. My people would not heed my voice. What does that mean? My people wouldn't obey me. They wouldn't do what I said. And Israel would have none of me. Do you see? God is equating. When you're not obeying Him, He is equating that with rejecting Him personally. What does that have to do with Baptist churches? Half of doctrine is obedience. And it is here that the idolatry of traditional Baptist churches shows itself most clearly. This is where we start to see our idolatry. Like Jeroboam's northern kingdom, you prove your idolatry by completely disregarding the practical and moral commandments of God in your congregation. Let me give you some examples. The command to go make disciples. Somebody tell me, what were the last words of Jesus Christ on the earth? What's that? Go. Matthew 28. Go. Uh, Acts chapter 1. What did he say? You'll be my witnesses. I'm, I'm out of here. See ya. Went up in the clouds. Now let me ask you a question. You have, let's say you have a father. You love your father. He is a, a godly and wise man. And he is, going, he is on his deathbed. And... and he pulls you over and he grabs you by your collar and he pulls you down and he says, this is what I want you to remember. And he says something to you. Do you think those words are important? That's the last thing he ever said to you. Don't you think you ought to be paying attention? What was the last thing that Jesus said for us to do? Go. Go but all I see are empty pews in here. I hear nobody's doing evangelism. Nobody's telling their neighbor about him. Nobody's, you're not doing anything as a group. Remember, half of, half of doctrine is obedience. So are you being obedient? When was the last time you changed something in this church to make the lost more comfortable here? When did you even think about the visitors who may come or the youth? Or the single parents when deciding how to spend your money. Hmm? It's all about me, isn't it? Me, 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 what I like, what I want. And look what you're getting for what you like. Look what you're getting for what you want. Death. What about mercy work to the poor? Do you re realize that God requires sacrificial, exhausting work for the needy? Do you realize that? Let me tell you, let me, let me read to you from the King James Version. Isaiah 58.10. I love the language that is used here. Isaiah 58, 10. God says this to His people. And if thou draw out thy, thy soul to the hungry. If you draw out your soul to the hungry. And satisfy the afflicted soul. Then your light shall rise in obscurity and your darkness be as noonday. Draw out your soul to the needy, to the hungry. Where are the ministries to the prostitutes? I thought we cared. Where are the ministries to the alcoholics? Where are the ministries to the drug addicts? Drug addiction is overwhelming this entire area. What are we doing about it? Remember, half of, obedient, half of, this, of doctrine is obedience. What kind of conduct do we see in our business meetings? Two dirtiest words in Baptist history. Business meetings. Business meeting. When was the last time someone threw a fit or worked themselves to death to swing votes their way? Hmm? When was the last time you ran off a preacher because you didn't like him? When did you last exercise church discipline for these kinds of actions? When did you call somebody to account for these? Furthermore, name one vote count in the New Testament. Go to the New Testament and find me one place where they tallied votes, where they have a, uh, somebody making a motion, somebody making a second, somebody tallying up the votes and giving the judgment. Who, name one. There isn't one. There's no voting in the New Testament. No voting in the New Testament. 
You've opened the door for Satan to come in and destroy you. Because you don't know the Word, you know what's been handed to you. How many pastors do you have? Have you always had just one pastor? Did you know this is completely unbiblical? The New Testament requirement is multiple pastors in every church. This is for your protection. In the New Testament, we have them called elders, pastors, shepherds, bishops. All those words mean the same thing. Let me read some verses to you here. Acts 14, 23. So when they, that are the apostles, had appointed elders in every church, the apostles had appointed elders, quote, plural, in every church. You see, you've been handed a tradition that every church is led by one pastor. It's simply not scriptural. And prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord. Titus 1.5, Paul's telling Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders, plural, in every city. The Philippian church had multiple pastors. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops, Bishops, remember, that's pastors, elders, they're all the same, and the deacons. I could go on and talk about the immature, childish behavior of Christian seniors. The first church that I served, full time. I remember getting there. This is going to hurt you now, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I remember getting there, and after about 30 days, 60 days, I realized I had two children's ministries. Here it comes. It's going to hurt now. It's going to hurt. But listen to me, I'm telling you the truth. One for everybody under six and one for everybody over 60. Childish, me, me, me. Why has it always got to be about the youth? That's my pew. It's too cold in here. It's too hot in here. I don't like your preaching. I don't like you. You don't wear a tie. Why don't you wear a tie? You know, today I left my shirt untucked just to offend you. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that I have to have my shirt tucked in to be godly. I could go on and talk about that. I could talk about the self-centered, shallow prayers. Prayer meetings. We don't pray in prayer meetings. We call them, we talk a little bit, we pray for three minutes, and then we leave. But Jesus said, my Father's house will be called what? A house of prayer. So we're not obeying that one either. So no evangelism, no mercy work. We haven't organized our churches correctly. We're not living right as elderly people. We don't pray enough. The false converts filling the pews, the unqualified teachers in Sunday school in small groups, the neglect of and the rejection of the Holy Spirit. When you do all this stuff against God's will, when you shun God's Word over and over and over, you are shunning the Holy Spirit. I don't care what you say with your lips. The Holy Spirit is offended. And the cowardice of most preachers to address the sins of the people. Any, any, any preachers listening to this? I want you to listen to something. Where have you been for the last 50 years? What have you been doing for the last 50 years that the church would decline so much under your watch? What Bible are you reading that you would not recognize these sins that are prevalent among the people? What God are you serving that you wouldn't have the courage to speak out and tell them what's going on? Where's the prophet today? The fact is, we are a people completely out of control. We do whatever we want, whenever we want, and we actually couldn't care less what God says about it. That's the truth. The fact is, you are idolaters, plain and simple, but you do not actually worship your traditions. What you worship is yourself. The church is just like you want it. Perfectly arranged to be the social club you've always desired. This is idolatry. And Christ is slamming the door in your face for it. I told you earlier that I was going to tell you why God sent all the churches home. What was Christ saying when he sent the churches home, all the people home? In point of fact, the coronavirus didn't empty the churches. It just showed them to be what Christ already sees them as. Empty, vain, fruitless temples of idolatry. So what are you going to do now? I told you he loves you. I told you he loves you. But it's gone on long enough. 
What are you going to do now? You've heard the word. The brother prayed that God would help us come to repentance. Are you going to stay stiff-necked? Are you going to keep thinking about yourself? Are you going to keep making the church into your little church that you can do whatever you want to in? Are you going to war in your mind against what I have told you? I see some of you warring in your mind right now. I can see it. Or are you going to soften your heart? Listen to what I'm saying. Lower your chin and repent. He wants to bless this place again. He wants to bring the life back to it again. You are not too old. You are not too few in number. This is the maker we're talking about here. I like it. You call him the creator God. He's the maker. By my God, I can leap over a wall. By my God, I can run through a troop. Do you believe that? It's not over for you. He's out the door. And he's knocking. Are you going to let him in? Are you going to repent? Are you going to recognize your specific role in this? And ask God for forgiveness? Or are you just going to lift your chin up and go, that guy's so mean. How can he talk to me that way? I've been going to this church for 40 years. Who does he think he is? Don't do it anymore. That's why you're in the situation you're in. Repent. He will forgive. Wipe it all away. Forget all about it. And fill the place again. How about that? How about that? It ain't over yet. And that's good grammar. Because He's merciful and patient. But you've got to listen. You've got to repent. This is the last word of Christ for you today from Zechariah chapter 1. The Lord has told me this. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, and I will return to you.